Okay, so I'm um, Christina Beatty. I'm from the Centre of Regional Economic and Social Research at Sheffield Hallam University. And thanks to Gwilym for asking me to chair this session. Uh, today's event is being jo jointly hosted by the Sheffield Spatial Analysis Network, the Urban Studies and Planning Department at the University of Sheffield, and the Understanding Inequalities Project. So we welcome you all um, to what is a very bright and sunny and snowy day here in Sheffield um, from wherever you might be. Okay, so Understanding Inequalities is a big ESRC funded programme of research that's looking at multi-dimensional and multi-spatial aspects of inequality throughout the UK. Um, and it's got a wide range of academics from a variety of disciplines across the UK who are looking at different aspects of inequality. So today's uh, session is drawing on a whole range of research um, looking at inequality and how it's derived from where people live, where they work, um, where they grow up, where they go to school, and uh, where they retire. Um, the hope is to encourage a debate and discussion around these issues, and so we'll be very welcome to you all contributing later to the questions. The plan is that um, Pat will first give his presentation for 25 minutes, and then Gwilym, um, and then there'll be 25 minutes, so we'll save all the questions to the end, and there'll be 25 minutes for discussion, um, which we'll try and moderate before we end the session. Okay, so the first presentation today is by Pat Sharkey, who's a professor of sociology and public affairs at the Princeton University in America. And his interests focus around the decline of violent crime and how that's affected urban life and urban inequality in America. Um, he's the author of numerous books, including Uneasy Peace, The Great De Crime Decline, The Renewal of City Life, and The Next War on Violence. Today, his presentation is called Breaking Down the Barricades, what we definitely need at the moment. Uh, he's going to explore the link between geography and inequality and how that's growing in the US uh, through a variety of mechanisms, including governmental policies and how these can create invisible barricades between disadvantaged and advantaged neighbourhoods. Um, the second presentation is by Gwilym Price, who's a professor of urban economics and social statistics at the University of Sheffield, where he's part of the Department of Urban Studies and Planning uh, and the Sheffield Methods Institute. And he's also the director of the SRC Centre for Doctoral Training. Um, as well as being co-director of the SRC Understandings Inequalities Project, he's also director of the SRC Nord's Force project called Life at the Frontier. And his research cover a range of areas, including housing, segregation, immigration and inequality. Um, and he's interested in uh, the impacts of social frontiers and how this can cause consequences of spatial inequality. Willem's presentation today is entitled Inequality is Personal Towards a Person-Centered Relational Approach to Spatial Inequality. And uh, he's going to propose a new conceptual framework for understanding spatial inequality that explores the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic spatial inequality. So it sounds like we've got a lot of interesting um, presentations and ideas to talk through today. Now, I think that means I can hand over straight away to Pat. And if it's OK, he can carry on with his presentation. So I'll see you on the other side. <laughs> Thanks, Christina. Um, let's see. OK. So, yeah, someone will have to let me know if, if I, I'm not coming through or uh, if the slides are not coming through. But I think we're all set here. Thanks for, for getting everything set up. It's really good to be with all of you. I wish I was there with you. I, I was in Sheffield a couple of years ago and was able to uh, take part in a conference there with this understanding inequalities group. It's really an incredible group of people. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm glad to be here. But, you know, when when this all ends, uh, we'll get back together in Sheffield or Edinburgh or somewhere uh, over there and, and do the next stage of this project. Um, for today, it's good to be with you and to be with uh, Gwilym on this on this panel. Um, so I'm going to talk about this concept that, that I've been thinking a lot about uh, 
called spatial barricades. And I, and I hate to start here, but I'm going to start here. So this is not a talk about COVID, I promise. Um, but it is a talk about how we solve big collective challenges. Uh, and I think uh, this, this challenge, this crisis that we're all going through uh, is a good example. It's a big national, it's an international challenge, but if, if we think about it at the national stage, it, it's a challenge that requires coordination. It requires collective action. It requ requires some sacrifice for a collective outcome. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about those kinds of challenges today. And everything that I'll talk about today relates to the US, um, but I thought I'd start here because this graph suggests that there may be something about the, the challenge that we're facing here in the US that you're all so facing there. Okay, so I don't think the, the problems that I'm gonna focus on are exclusive to the US. Um, so COVID is a big national challenge that requires coordination and collective action. This graph is a pretty good reminder that the US is not great at solving these kinds of, of challenges that require some large scale mobilization and investment. But the point I wanna make here is that our experience with the coronavirus is not anomalous. Um, when this pandemic ends, we'll have a set of challenges that wait for us. Uh, my colleagues here at Princeton and Case and Angus Deaton uh, have recently published their book on what they call deaths of despair. Uh, these are deaths due to detachment. Um, they are uh, deaths from, from suicide, uh, deaths from alcoholism, deaths from uh, drug overdoses. Uh, and as you see in, in this graph, um, if you look from 2000 onward in the US, we've just seen this dramatic rise in these deaths, which signify some level of alienation, some, some detachment uh, that, is, that is affecting the health of Americans on a large scale. Um, if we go back a little bit further in time, uh, we've had this major change in US society where for birth cohorts all the way up till uh, just before World War II, uh, it was um, almost automatic that children would go up and in absolute terms uh, do better than their parents, uh, make more in, in, in the labor market than their parents. Uh, so about 90% of, of children did better than their parents in an absolute sense in, for the birth cohorts going up to 1940. And then that's dropped steadily in the decades since to now uh, we're in a situation where uh, at least going up to the birth cohorts around 1980, um, about half of American kids can expect to do better than their parents in an absolute sense. Um, we've seen a dramatic rise in economic inequality from 1980 to the present. Uh, there's been just enormous growing gaps between the most affluent uh, and the rest of the distribution uh, and, and the gaps grow larger the higher up you go in, in the income distribution. Um, racial and ethnic gaps haven't narrowed uh, and this, has hap this is true if we go back all the way uh, to the 1960s there's a story in the U.S. about progress toward racial equality and there has been progress in some dimensions of, of inequality but if you look at uh, this graph shows wealth um, if you look at income, unemployment, home ownership, uh, college degree completion, uh, we still have these yawning racial gaps uh, that represent some fundamental dimension of inequality and injustice. And then we have some other phenomena that are more specific to the U.S. Uh, mass shootings, shootings where you know at least three people are. Uh, are, are shot in, in a public space, typically defined as violence for the sake of violence, uh, has been rising steadily over time. Police killings, which has gotten so much attention in the US, particularly in the past year, but really in the past five or six years, the number hasn't budged, even as all this attention has been given to this national tragedy. Uh, there's still about, I think the best source tells us there's about a thousand people who are killed uh, by law enforcement every year. That hasn't changed with all this attention. And then a, a challenge that we all face is uh, 
the imminent threat, the current threat uh, of, of climate change. Uh, and so average temperature keeps rising. Um, uh, we are all dealing uh, with this same crisis, but we don't have solutions. Um, and, and, and so I, I'm sorry to bring everybody down with this list of, of uh, uh, but it's really a list of grand challenges. Um, and, and so I, I think we have to acknowledge that the challenge that we're all going through right now is not anomalous. Uh, it is one of many collective challenges. Uh, and so the question is, why are we so bad at solving these kinds of, of very big challenges? Uh, how can we make sense of it and how can we do, do better? How can we move toward a, a, a politics, a policy making uh, arena where um, Americans come together uh, and, and, and look to solve these kinds of big challenges? So I'm going to make a four part argument about what has happened um, in the US. And you might disagree that some of these uh, things are more urgent than others. Uh, you might have other grand challenges that you nominate as more important than the ones that I mentioned. Um, but the specific problems and challenges are less important than the broader argument I'm going to make here uh, in four points. And, and the first point is here on the screen. As trust in government has fallen, the U.S. has stopped trying to solve many of its most pressing problems with collective mobilization and investment. And this decline in trust is a very real uh, change that's taken place from the 1960s to the present, where in the 60s, you know, at least in, in the most common surveys of uh, do you trust uh, the, the, or the political leaders in Washington? Um, it, the numbers around the Kennedy administration used to be up around 70, 80 percent. Uh, now those numbers are, are below 20 percent. Most Americans no longer trust the federal government to solve its, its major challenges. So instead of coming together to make the kinds of investments uh, and take the collective uh, action and mobilization uh, to solve big challenges. What I'm arguing is that the U.S. has responded in a different way. It, is, it has begun over time to respond to large scale challenges by giving groups of Americans ways to avoid them. OK, so we've adopted this policy agenda focused around separation, not solutions, but separation as the response to major challenges in the U.S. OK, so we have a social policy driven by the goal of separation uh, and the most common mechanism and the empirical stuff that I'll focus on today uh, is, is to move toward this goal of separation through the establishment of what I call uh, spatial barricades. OK, and um, spatial barricades are just just to define what I mean real quick and then I'll show you some examples. But spatial barricades are, are defined as informal or formal boundaries that divide and regulate the use of space. OK, so let me provide some e examples here. Um, and all the examples that, that I'll talk about, uh, I'm just using uh, images from Atlanta, Georgia, um, and I could use a, a, a number of cities. These are, are processes uh, that have taken place all, all over the country, but Atlanta is a particularly vivid illustration of how some of these boundaries have been formed uh, and their impact that they've had over time. Um, so this is a map that, that may be familiar to, to some of you who have studied the history of US urban policy, but this is a map of, of the homeowners uh, loan corporation, which was was developed as a federal agency uh, in the 1930s after the, the, the depression and the, and the crisis of home ownership that arose from that. Um, and it was designed as an agency that, that would um, assess uh, properties uh, based on the riskiness of those properties uh, in, in US cities. Um, this is where the term redlining comes from, because if you look at the, the map, what you'll see is that these assessors went through uh, neighborhoods and classified those communities based on the riskiness uh, that would accrue for to, to ensure the loans in that community, home loans in that community. Um, and as part of this process, they use characteristics like the percentage of immigrants, the racial and ethnic composition of the community um, to assess the worthiness or the riskiness of, of ensuring loans within those communities. Um, this is the first, the first published uh, prod, uh, paper from this uh, 
this project where I collaborated with, with uh, a number of, of people, um, Bosch, uh, Bashkar Mazumder, Dan Aronson, Dan Hartley, Jacob Faber, um, so a group of economists and sociologists to look at the long-term consequences of these barricades. So when I, when I talk about barricades in space, this is the kind of thing that I have in mind, an intervention that marks a section of a city or an urban area and marks it for disinvestment or investment, okay? And in this case, these, are, these areas of Atlanta were marked by a group of assessors um, based on, in part, on racial and ethnic composition, immigration status, economic status, and the impact of those marks, the impact of drawing those boundaries on the map can be found in terms of the economic outcomes of families within those same neighborhoods 70 years later. Okay, so this is what I mean when I talk about the consequences of spatial barricades. It's a policy of outlining areas in space and as a mechanism for investment or disinvestment that has long-term consequences. Okay, so red line is a good example. I'm just gonna go through another uh, few examples real quick. Um, the interstate highway system is one of the most important interventions in urban space in the US carried out, I think, over the past century. Um, this was a, uh, a system that was designed for the purposes of defense and trade, uh, but local jurisdictions were able to determine the location of where interstate highways uh, intersected central cities. So this, again, is an example of Atlanta before uh, the highway construction. Uh, this is Atlanta afterwards, and you can see um, this is a highway that was constructed through the heart of a black community, ex an expanding black community in Atlanta, and it was designed explicitly to divide that black community from the white, what were white communities to the north. It wasn't successful. The black community expanded well beyond the boundaries uh, laid out here, but the, but the intervention of interstate highways worked in two ways. A, it, it was used to literally divide space, to, to separate black and white communities in lots of cities across the country. But secondly, it gave a mechanism for families within central cities to escape the, un the fiscal distress, uh, the racial integration that was happening in central cities in the US and move to suburban areas while also being able to still take part in economic activity within the city. So this is a massive intervention in the urban space that was specifically designed around the goal of separation, okay? Um, a third example, this is Sandy Springs, Georgia. This is an area just to the north of Atlanta that when, when Atlanta was trying to expand its boundaries in the 1960s because it was expanding so quickly, the residents of Sandy Springs, which was not an incorporated city, got together and said, to resist being annexed by, by Atlanta, okay? So they, their, the goal was to avoid being a part of that city, to avoid all the challenges that Atlanta was, was um, uh, undergoing in the 1960s. And they were successful over time. So Sandy Springs became its own independent city with its own uh, revenue sources. Um, and, and it won't shock you that this has become a, this is a primarily white neighborhood, primary, uh, I'm sorry, white city, primarily affluent city. Um, they, they have gained notoriety for, for contracting out most public services um, to, to private companies. Um, and then this, what this map shows you is another dimension of, of this effort toward spatial barricades and separation. 85% of Sandy Springs is zoned for single family residence homes. Okay, so that this means that it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to build affordable housing in Sandy Springs. So this is another form of barricade that makes this an exclusive community that will never not be an exclusive community. This is what I have in mind when I talk about spatial barricades. So I'm carrying out a, a large scale uh, project that is designed to gather national data on a whole range of interventions in urban space and the barricades that arise from those interventions. Um, it includes all of the, the things that you uh, see on the screen, but you can, you, this is not just about old interventions from the 1950s and 60s. It's also about the establishment of special water and sewer districts. Okay, we had a crisis in Flint, Michigan, 
where the water was poisoned with, with lead, okay? That's, again, not anomalous. That's a function of how space is carved up and divided in ways that amplify inequality uh, in local resources uh, and the consequences that arise from it. Okay, land use regulations, uh, the placement of highways, uh, business improvement districts, which are fortified zones of, of commerce in, in the US. Um, and then of course, uh, some very different kinds of barricades that come in the form of jails and prisons. Um, so very quickly, I want to um, just talk about the empirical work that I'm, I'm doing here uh, around uh, the, this concept of spatial barricades. So just to reiterate kind of the big picture argument um, that I'm making uh, it, it, and to kind of put us back to the, the original slides on, on the coronavirus and other big challenges. You know, I'm arguing that in the US over time, uh, we have stopped trying to solve these problems. Instead, we have designed a policy agenda around the goal of separation. The primary mechanism to carry out that goal of separation is the establishment of spatial barricades. Okay, and then the empirical part, the empirical work that I'm doing right now is to look at the consequences. Okay, and I'll, I'll argue that there are three main consequences of uh, our, our reliance on spatial barricades. Barricades facilitate segregation and concentrate disadvantaged groups and social problems in space. Now, I'm just going to give you a bunch of, of uh, findings here and not talk much about the methods that I'm using. Let me just say a quick word to, to say that the kind of empirical work that I'm doing is I'm looking at, in, in this case, they're called commuting zones, which are basically contiguous counties in the US that define all of the areas connected to a central city. Uh, so I'm looking at commuting zones across the, the whole country. Uh, I'm looking at the relationship between different forms of barricades that come in the form of gated communities, land use regulations, interstate highways, uh, the formation of local school districts and, and local governments. Uh, and looking at the association between those barricades and a range of outcomes. The second piece of this, uh, and I'm happy to take questions, is I try to look for natural experiments, sources of exogenous change in all these barricades in order to move toward causal inferences about their impact on a range of outcomes. Okay, so that's kind of the background um, for the, uh, the, the broad findings that I'm gonna go through very quickly. Okay, so the first, the first um, uh, piece of the argument, our reliance on barricades has had three consequences. The first is that barricades facilitate segregation and concentrate disadvantaged groups and social problems in space. So one of the early findings um, related to this just looks at the amount of space, physical space occupied uh, by segments of the population at different points in the income distribution. And what this is showing you is that from 1970 to the present, poverty in the US has become more and more consolidated in space. So the most affluent, uh, which are the, the solid lines, the, those are people at the 75th and 90th percent of the income distribution, uh, have started to take up more space uh, in, in urban areas, uh, and the poor have been consolidated and compressed over time. Second consequence, barricades amplify inequality. And here I'm looking at upward and downward economic mobility. Uh, using data from Raj Chetty uh, and his Opportunity Insights project, uh, where he has been able to access data from the Internal Revenue Service uh, and, and, and measure uh, upward and downward income mobility across the whole country. Okay, so this again takes us back to Atlanta. Um, and there's a, you know, I'm just claiming here that there's a causal effect on economic mobility. This map just shows you what it looks like. So you see the boundary of Atlanta uh, in, in the top left portion of, of the map. And what this means is that if you were just outside that boundary, Sandy Springs is a dark blue area just north of, of Atlanta. Um, children from the same point in the income distribution can expect on average to move up much higher uh, when, they, when they reach adulthood than children from within the city limits of Atlanta. Okay, so this is a manifestation of the establishment of a barricade and then the consequences 
uh, for income mobility and economic opportunity uh, in the next generation. And then third, bar barricades reduce the chances for collective mobilization and problem solving. And this gets us back to those original uh, slides. Um, and this is, this is a more challenging um, argument to make. And so I've been looking at kind of a range of different outcomes uh, that, that get at our capacity to solve collective challenges. Um, so this, this is a map from Ryan Enos and Jacob Brown who just looked segregation by political affiliation, literally by who people voted for in the 2016 presidential election. And you can see this pattern that is reproduced across the country where density is, is one of the best predictors of voting for the Republican or Democratic Party uh, in 2016 and, and now the 2020 election. Um, so again, this is Atlanta that you're, you're seeing, which is deep blue. Um, uh, strongly uh, uh, in favor of um, uh, Democrat, uh, Democratic presidential candidates, but in all the outlying areas, the areas that are connected by interstate highways, that are separated by the boundaries of, of, of municipalities, uh, that have separate school districts, okay, um, that have more restrictive or exclusionary land use regulations, there is this political divide that maps on top of it. Um, if we look at collective outcomes like greenhouse gas emissions per area, uh, strongly associated with the prevalence of these different kinds of barricades, uh, the overall civic engagement uh, and institutional health of, of an urban area, again, strongly predicted by uh, barricades. And then getting us back to that original slide on coronavirus, um, if you look at, so there's a national survey of uh, self-reported uh, uh, usage of masks carried out in July of last year. Uh, and again, it's the, the finding is not that overall mask usage, uh, this, this kind of form, this, this very clear uh, expression of solidarity um, is associated with barricades, but the gap in the places that have the highest mask usage and the lowest mask usage, that is strongly predicted by uh, the prevalence of, of barricades. Okay, so the four main points, and I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to Gwilym here uh, in a second, but um, let me just reiterate these four big points or you can look at them on, on the screen. Uh, so this is the empirical argument, and then it leaves us with a question, and I'm not gonna answer this question um, because I'm, I'm still uh, at a very early stage uh, in, in this work, and I'm really interested in ideas here. Uh, I think it is an open question. Um, but it is the central question that I think we all have to consider. Okay, so if this argument is right, in the, a spatially divided nation, how do we bring people together to solve collective challenges? Um, how, do, how do we reverse this pattern uh, that we've seen emerge in the US and lots of other places, uh, particularly over the past 50 years or so? So I'm gonna leave with that question um, and I hope we can have some discussion of that question or, or answer any questions about the empirical work that went in this. But thanks everyone for joining. I'm very much looking forward to what Willem has to say. Thanks, Pat, that's great. Um, are we ready uh, to move on to Gwilym's one? Yeah, good to go. Great job, over to you. Thank you and welcome uh, everyone. Uh, special thanks to Pat for um, that superb presentation. So, so much uh, richness there and hopefully we can come back to that um, in the discussion. So my goal in this talk is to set out a new conceptual framework for thinking about inequality. But, uh, that, that sounds like a very bold, <laughs> uh, ambitious objective, um, but it is uh, somewhat tentative and it's work in progress. So very much um, appreciate any thoughts and comments and references that you can you can help me with. I'm, I'm an economist trying to explore the interface with sociology and geography. So I have lots to learn and, and very open to to advice and uh, and direction. So what sort of model am I or, or conceptual framework am I thinking of? It's one that emphasizes uh, 
a relational, personal, person-centered approach that brings together elements of the intrinsic and the extrinsic uh, approaches to inequality. What do I mean by intrinsic and extrinsic? The intrinsic is that which is internal to our self-perceptions and our perceptions of the world, how we think of ourselves, how, how uh, our sense of self-efficacy and self-worth and status anxiety are formed. The idea is that in this view of the world, our well-being is determined by how we see ourselves in relation to others. You're probably familiar, if you're from the UK, with the work by Wilkinson and Pickett, the spirit level, where they argue very much along these lines. The idea that, that an increase in income inequality, for example, leads to society becoming more hierarchical, increases status anxiety, increases a sense of rivalry and threat in human relations. That in turn lowers a sense of self-worth and, and, and trust and increases the potential for conflict. In contrast to this, a completely different um, explanation of why inequality matters and why it impacts on well-being and, and health, etc., is more in line with the sort of arguments that Pat was using there and, and, and some of Pat's previous work, particularly with George Golster, on spatial opportunity structures. And that's this intrinsic view of the world. By this, I mean processes external to ourselves, to our conscious subjective perception, perception of the world, the impersonal, the mechanistic and structural forces that shape our world and our well-being. This perspective highlights the external forces that are unleashed or intensified by inequality, forces that would have an impact even if we had no self-awareness or no sense of uh, subjective position. And in this perspective, the, the uh, kind of spatial opportunities, market sorting perspective says that if there's an increase in inequality, that intensifies these market sorting processes of the market and potentially also concentrates political power amongst the wealthy. That in turn affects planning decisions. It creates a concentration of poverty in some areas and affluence in other areas. It increases spatial inequality and spatial fragmentation. That in turn reduces the spatial opportunity structures, the opportunity to progress in, in life through access to employment, education, etc. It increases deprivation, reduces health and well-being. So how can we bring these two very different mechanisms and perspectives on the impacts of inequality? Where, where might we start to, to come up with a coherent framework for reconciling them? Well, let's begin with this uh, emergence of relational sociology over the past 20 years. One of the proponents uh, and pioneers of that approach is Donati, who says society is not a space containing relations or an arena where relations are, are, are played. Rather, it's the very tissue of relations. Society is relation. It does not have relations. And even our formation as individuals, our sense of self, our perception of the world, our identity, our views, our ideologies, prejudices, behavior, etc. Actually, they're all formed, not in isolation, but through our interrelations with one another. Everything is relational. So where does this relational sociology take us in terms of its perspective on inequality? Tantalizingly, Donati raised this question of what factors and processes generate relational bads that are destructive of human relations. And, and, and when you read that, you think, oh, he's going to go down the route of exploring the direct impacts of inequality on human relations. But actually, that's not quite what happens, at least as I understand it. Instead, relational sociology has tended to focus on the process of relational differentiation, the social formations that are that associational in kind, that are built up through networking. And 
the circulation of relational goods, the benefits of being part of and maintaining certain uh, social cliques. Perhaps the uh, person that's most associated and most influential in, in this school is, is Bordeaux. He very much focused on the role of, of cultural capital in reproducing inequalities, how forms of speech and accents and cultural preferences and access to particular cultural cliques all serve to maintain the status quo. This is you know, incredibly rich and exciting, particularly when you encounter these ideas for the first time. But one of the questions that it raises for me is, is this really the primary way that inequality is re reproduced in society? It may well have a role, but is that really all that relational sociology gives us? Can we extend the relational sociology approach to inc include these more direct relational impacts of inequality on well-being, and perhaps even include the spatiality of inequalities, some of the ideas that Pat was talking about, the role of these extrinsic processes. And I think one way forward is to think perhaps of the Wilkinson and Pickett um, approach as an extension of that relational sociology. And you might even call it relational epidemiology. And in the remainder of this talk, I'm basically just going to try to summarize that approach, then set it up as a straw man, highlighting a number of, of problems or limitations, which I appreciate are somewhat caricatured, but I'm really just going to use them as stepping stones towards a, what I hope is uh, a more capacious relational model, which I call uh, the inequality nexus. So just to recap, what do I mean by relational epidemiology? This is a, a school of thought, a branch of literature that focuses not so much on the processes of inequality reproduction, but on the, the psychological effects of inequality. And the idea is that the more unequal the income distribution, the more hierarchical society becomes and the greater the sense of threat that we have in our relation, relations with others. And this in turn creates status anxiety, which in turn leads to health and social problems and conflict. And this hypothesis, at, at least superficially, seems to be borne out in the data. And you probably be familiar with with some of these graphs I'm about to show you, that basically show how national or state level inequality are correlated with a whole range of negative social and health outcomes, ranging from mental illness, health and social problems, child well-being, drug use, imprisonment, life expectancy, child mortality, etc. So, for example, here's a, a simple scatter plot of rich countries showing how the prevalence of mental illness mental illness is higher in more unequal rich countries. Life expectancy is longer in more equal rich countries. Levels of trust are higher in more equal rich countries. And so on. There's a whole series of graphs. If you've seen the spirit level book that, that tries to map out some of these relations. But there are problems, I think, and I'm going to highlight problems or limitations, um, albeit in a caricatured way, uh, and use these as stepping stones towards the kind of integrated approach that we want to develop. The first problem is what I've called finding the relational horizon. In a lot of this work, it's assumed that it's the income distribution at the national level or the state level that influences people's perception of their status and self-worth and, and that makes me wonder why that particular relational horizon why not a regional distributional horizon or, or, a, or a neighborhood one and then that 
that skepticism deepens <laughs> in problem two, where I say, actually, do people really think in terms of distributions at all? Perhaps statisticians do. And uh, I take my hat off to to, to all, all the statisticians that have joined us. No offense, but normal people, I don't think, really think that way. I mean, I'm going to argue for a much more dyadic uh, uh, determination of subjective uh, uh, ideas of our status. The third problem follows on from that, and that's actually maybe it's not distributions at a national level or any level that matters, but it's actually the local inequality structures and relations that determine and shape our perception of status. And then problem four is, is really where we go bold and we try to say, well, how can we address this lack of extrinsic, uh, lack, lack of accounting for extrinsic explanation in that relational epidemiological approach? How can we bring that into a more coherent, capacious model? And finally, the capstone, if you like, is how do we move from a unidimensional approach, a focus on income or a focus on wealth, to a multidimensional inequality approach? Okay, let me just say a bit more about some of those. So problem number one, I said, where is the true relational horizon? There's this tendency to focus on the effect of national distributions. But do most people really know where they are on the income distribution? Do, do you know where you are on the UK income distribution, for example? Do you think of yourself as being in the top 60% of earners? Do you think of yourself as being in the top 50% or the top 30% or the top 10%. Well, while you ponder on that, let me introduce you to this chap here, who you may recognize from a Question Time current affairs panel show that took place on the BBC last year. And this chap took great exception to a particular member of the, the panel. Uh, this chap was just in the audience and one of the panel members was from the Labour Party who was advocating raising income tax on people over earning over £80,000 a year. And he said, the Labour MP said that this, these were people that were in the top 5% of earners. And this enraged this chap in the audience who earns £80,000 a year and he said it was absurd to say that he was in the top 5%. He said, I, I'm nowhere near the top 5%. I'm not even in the top 50%. So he, he genuinely thinks that while earning £80,000 a year, he's not even earning the average wage. This gap between his perceived position on the income distribution and his actual is enormous. And that really affects, fundamentally calls into question, I think, this, uh, this kind of Wilkinson and Pickett notion that it's all about uh, our position on the income distribution. I'm simplifying their approach, of course. Just as point of fact, if you were wondering where you are on the income distribution, I'd be interested to know in the chat, um, you can maybe post whether you overestimated or underestimated significantly where you are uh, in the income distribution. If you're earning £30,000 a year, you're in the top 36%. If you're earning £40,000 a year, you're in the top 20%. If you're earning £50,000 a year, you're in the top 12%. If you're in, earning 60000 you're in the top 8%. And if you're lucky enough to be earning 70000 you're in the top 6%. 80000 puts you in the top 5%. And if you're earning 100000 you're in the top 3%. And what's interesting is that most people tend to, most affluent people tend to underestimate their position in the income distribution. So how do we get it so wrong? And in particular, how does this chap <laughs> uh, get it so wrong in terms of his perceptions? Perhaps he's not influenced by the national relational horizon, if you like, for the income distribution. Perhaps it's the regional one or the neighborhood or the fa his family or his workplace. Perhaps actually we're influenced by multiple relational horizons, each having different levels of influence on our overall position 
in society, or at least our perception of our overall position in society. But let me deepen the question here and say, you know, do we actually think distributionally at all? Or do we actually base our perceptions on the sum of dyadic comparisons? By dyadic, I mean comparing ourselves with an individual. And let me illustrate this with a parable, which I've called Marx's Little House on the Prairie story. And the story goes something like this. The house may be large or small, as long as the neighboring houses are likewise small. It satisfies all social requirements for residents, if so. But let there arise next to the little house a palace, and the little house then shrinks to a hut. The little house now makes it clear that its inmate has no social position at all to maintain. So perhaps our intuitive, subjective sense of the distribution is actually based on a stream of dyadic comparisons, where dyadic is the relation between two individual entities. We're always comparing ourselves with another person. And you can think of this as being a, a kind of a phenomenological process. What I'm saying is that our perception of status is a fluid dynamic of quasi-conscious conceptions, born of a constant stream of dyadic comparisons, some merely fleeting and distant, others lingering, persistent and immediate, but all shaping the amorphous stream of self-conscious self perception of our social position relative to others. There are two key takeaway messages for me from Marx's parable. The first is that inequality is, is personal and by definition relational. We are ultimately unequal relative to someone. And I'm arguing that subjective perception of our relative position is really the sum of bilateral dyadic relations. Our, our, any perception that we have of distributions is really an aggregation of those dyadic comparisons. And the second takeaway message from me is that inequality is local. There is a spatial dimension to the way we sum these dyadic subjective perceptions, the sum of relational inequalities that influences our perceptions has, has a geographical component to it. In Marx's analogy, it was the guy next door that we compare ourselves to, or perhaps it's who we sit next to at work. Perhaps it's it's people in, in persons in our family. So this parable of dyadic thinking leads us to propose a dyadic model as the foundation for inequality analysis. So the idea is that you build up from these one to one relations. That's really how our perception of the world works. And we propose two types of of network. Because if you if you go with this dyadic structural foundation, that makes it very amenable to using a, a network or graph theory approach to represent that that theory. So what kind of networks could we use to to represent relational inequality? Well, there are two that, that we propose. The first is what we've called inequality networks. And here, two nodes, nodes are joined if there is, to represent inequality. So it's a, it's a directed uh, graph, if you like, if you're familiar with graph theory. The other is what we've called equality networks. And here, the link between two nodes represents the two nodes that are actually equal. And together, we propose that the inequality networks and equality networks provide a conceptual framework for representing and synthesizing inequality co concepts in, in, in a very rich way. So just to reiterate, uh, inequality networks, these are directed links rep that represent inequality. So that the direction of the arrow indicates who's unequal uh, relative to who. If 
there's a bi-directional arrow there. It, it, it means that, that actually those two nodes are, are relatively equal in whatever dimension we're looking at. Equality networks, on the other hand, there's only a link if the, the, those two nodes, those two individuals are roughly equal um, in that particular domain. So for example, we might say I and J are if the income of I is approximately equal to J. And that then allows us to construct these rich structural depictions of inequality relations. So to illustrate the inequality network for Marx's parable of the little house, we start off by neighboring houses all being likewise small. So we've got three individuals here, one, two, and three. All the houses are roughly the same. And so there, this is a, an inequality network. The arrow flo flows two ways, which suggests they're all roughly equal. Then let's see what happens. Because in this world, as it stands, where everyone's equal, person one feels content with his place in the world. Then let there arise, says Marx, next to the little house, a palace. Person four, build his whopping great palace. And all of a sudden you see these, these very strong um, directional arrows representing inequality and the inmate of that house has no social position at all to maintain in other words his status anxiety has suddenly gone through the roof his self-perception has, has plummeted so more generally what we are proposing is a way of building up a theory of inequality impacts from the foundation of spatially contextualized dyadic relations and by expressing it in a graph theory or network analysis framework that will allow us to visualize and quantify in a rich and nuanced way the complex variety of inequality structures and it's these inequality structures particularly at a local level but also we could extend them at different spatial scales it's these that really shape our perception of status so for example we can show a whole variety of potential configurations whether you're a big fish in a small pond, for example, or a small fish in a big pond, um, might profoundly affect your sense of status. So here's what we've been looking at. A big fish in a small pond, person A is uh, has a vastly bigger house or more income than person F, E and C. This is the opposite way around, where person A is a small fish in a small pond. And we can then, I won't go through these, but we can then explore these. these we can explore these as, 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 as tree networks. We can explore the structure of them. Similarly, for equality networks, where one, two, and three have, a, uh, have a, a, an edge that joins them because they're approximately equal in terms of their income or wealth, whatever we're interested in. And we can then apply the rich structural metrics that are available in network analysis to, to understand the properties of nodes and links. All of this, this rich, this, this rich structural inequality, all this is overlooked in a relational epidemiology approach that overlooks the impact of these local inequality structures on subjective status and well-being. Now let's move make a big step now and say to, what, to get towards this inequality nexus, we, need, we said we wanted to make it an integrated approach. We wanted to bring together the extrinsic and the in, intrinsic. How might we do that? How might we account for extrinsic explanations and processes in a relational framework? And that's really important that we do that because even in the absence of status anxiety, what Pat has demonstrated, spatial opportunities and inequalities will profoundly affect our well-being. It's the fact that the housing market sorts low income households into areas with the least desirable housing, the highest pollution, the highest crime rates, the worst schools, the worst job opportunities, the worst access to green space. That's what affects their well-being, not where they see themselves on some abstract notion of a national income distribution, one could argue. How can we do that? How can we bring the extrinsic into this framework? Well, actually, the extrinsic, these sorting process, these, these processes of, of concentrating poverty in certain areas, it's that that shapes and determines these configurations of local inequality structures. 
So the extrinsic plays a really important role in this model. And we can expand that. We can even apply the inequality and equality networks at the neighborhood level. We can, we can use the same kind of frameworks to look at the, the configuration, the juxtaposition of deprived areas next to affluent ones, which we know is potentially really important in a spatial opportunity structures framework. And we can go one step further by enriching our characterization of neighborhoods, not just in terms of attributes, uh, not in, just in terms of deprivation, but also by including these lower level measures of individual level inequality structures in those neighborhood characterizations. The final step then, and I'm almost there, is to include the multi-dimensional nature of inequality because in reality inequality is not just about income distributions it's also about access to employment and education and housing exposure to pollution and crime etc how can we include these in a relational model well what we're proposing is that you can do that you can conceptualize these as multiple dimensions of inequality represented as layers in the inequality nexus. So person one, two, and three, four, five, and six, they have a set of, of inequality or equality relations in an income domain. But they also we can represent them simultaneously in a housing domain, education domain, security domain, all as different levels in a multiplex network. And crucially, this inequality nexus is fundamentally person-centered and intersectional. So person one, for example, has overlapping disadvantage in multiple domains, and we see that immediately. And it may be that there are particular characteristics of person one in terms of their gender, their ethnicity, their race, that, that means that they are more likely to be disadvantage in those multiple domains. So we can tease out these intersectional inequalities much more, uh, much more clearly. And look, we can combine the, this, this, this multi-level network approach with other networks, with social networks, with transport networks, with crime networks and trade networks. So in summary, then, um, much of our thinking we're arguing about inequality tends to be either distributional based on measures of the overall distribution of income or ecological based on indices of deprivation at neighborhood level rather than at individual level and it's impossible to explore intersectional inequality if using an ecological approach i've said that the emergence of relational epidemiology has highlighted the relational impacts of inequality and that's been really important However, it tends to focus on national distributions and the single dimensions of inequality. And it also tends to overlook these really important extrinsic processes that, that Pat has so clearly demonstrated as being important. Our starting point is to say that inequality is relational. Individuals cannot be equal, unequal in isolation. We're always unequal relative to another person. And what we're saying is that from this dyadic I, uh, foundation, we build a theory of inequality. It brings together the intrinsic and the extrinsic into an inequality nexus. And finally, I'm going to conclude by saying we think that there are some, some useful features of this integrated approach. In summary, first of all, it's, it's person centered rather than variable centers. It, it focuses on the cumulative effect on particular individuals. It's relational rather than distribution. It encourages us to think about distributional horizons and the dyadic composition of status perceptions. And it highlights the relative position of individuals and how this position changes in multiple dimensions across space and time. It emphasizes the importance of local inequality structures and relations and the role of extrinsic processes such as market sorting, uh, such as the kind of the powers of political economy that affect planning and how they shape those inequality relations at a local level. And finally, I think that this, by posing a theoretical framework in a, a, a network environment, um, 
that opens up a rich array of new measures drawing on the foundational um, features of, of networks um, and it opens up a whole new expansive framework for measuring inequality in, in rich new ways. Thank you. Uh, comments um, and questions, welcome. Back to you, Christina. Hi, everyone. Well, I have to say that I found that fascinating, both talks, but also the interconnection between the two in terms of people's perception of in, their, where they are on the income scales and inequality relative to uh, the groups that they move within or the people that they know. Um, and how this relates to Pat's earlier ideas in and around how uh, structural um, policies can reinforce segregation and barriers between people. So um, I, don't, I don't know whether you've ever seen it, Gwilym, that study that um, Ian Cole did at Sheffield Hallam, or well, poverty in place, about whether you were happier to be poor living in a poor area or whether mm -hmm. it was if you were poor living in a wealthy area. So I think those wow. points that sort of transferred across both your talks was really interesting. We've had lots mm -hmm. of comments and questions. I've got to do my best to sort of uh, mm -hmm. solve these and move through these. Um, uh, and I think starting off with comments about how much they echoed with people's own perceptions, areas they live within and, and the areas that they know. So David White, White sorry, David Watt said, uh, the spatial divide is very reminiscent of Glasgow and suburbs annexed out of the city based on social class when he was thinking about Pat's talk. Um, and uh, Sophia also said about the barricades, spatial barricades concept really resonates well with some research that she's been doing on spatial retail inequalities. Um, so she's asked, can we drop in some um, references to any of your work that might have something to do with um, some of the papers that you've published so that we can share those with the wider group. Um, M.S. Smith, um, again, first picking up on Pat's talk, um, to what extent are these barriers the product of policy planning or individual household decisions? And if the latter, what could be used as a policy lever to reduce the barricades? So I think that that transitions nicely from your talk, Pat, and some of the ideas as well that Willem was talking about. So over to you on that one. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I, I do think um, there is this question about does, you know, do the patterns that I'm describing arise from uh, structural structural forces, policy decisions, or, or individual decisions? And, and you know, I, I see this as historically specific uh, in the U.S. Like, I, I, I do think there was a clear moment when um, the nation, uh, through the federal government primarily, was trying to take on uh, a, a set of problems and challenges that were most visible in central cities. And, and that included, you know, so, social unrest, racial injustice, uh, pollution, fiscal distress. Um, a, a whole set of, of challenges that, that really came bundled in, in central cities in the 1960s and gave up. Um, so that moment in the late 60s was when there was this national shift toward a new approach. And, and it came really after, you know, the series of riots spread through uh, American cities. Um, uh, Lyndon Johnson kind of gave up on uh, pushing forward with uh, the conclusions of the Kerner Commission. Um, so we, we can go through a lot more detail. But the point is, at that moment, there was a large scale policy shift, uh, really with the election of Richard Nixon, that, that took a different approach. And instead of seeking out federal approaches to solving these big challenges, instead laid out a, an explicit agenda designed to allow people to escape those, those challenges and those problems. So I do think it like individual decisions are crucial here and individual agency is crucial, but those decisions were facilitated by a set of, of large scale interventions 
uh, starting all the way back with the red line neighborhoods, but continuing through the placement of interstate highway systems, um, continuing through exclusionary land use policies, continuing through the establishment of new school districts and new, uh, new local towns and, and cities um, that gave people a mechanism to escape. Okay, so it, if, if you are in a, uh, an, an, a setting where um, you have two options and one is to try to solve the, the problem or the other is to try to escape it and you're, it's made very clear that we're not going to try to solve this problem, then that, that leads to a strong motivation to escape. And, and you know, this is also obviously rooted in longstanding uh, and very severe uh, racial inequality and white supremacy, um, which which is at the heart of everything that that I'm talking about uh, with this policy history. But I do think it was a, a set of massive interventions allowed for a new approach that centered on separation and, and escape. Uh, so those individual decisions have to be seen within that context of, of uh, what are the, the structural interventions that have um, that have been implemented to deal with these large scale problems that occurred in the US. I think there's a nice uh, follow up question here from um, somebody who's only identified as AP. Um, but in <laughs> some ways, to what extent uh, the products of policy and planning and ensuing these barricades exist um, are related to political influence and vote seeking in the first place. There's a bit of a follow up to that, but I think that's probably the nub of it. And I think that, Willem, relates to some of the levelling up agenda that's going on in Britain at the moment in terms of um, the chicken and egg to do with um, is it the politics or is it the policy and, and which bitch drives each, each other for place based policy interventions. Willem, do you want to weigh in on that one? Yeah, I, I mean, one of the one of the questions I, I once asked um, Richard Wilkinson at one of his presentations of his uh, uh, kind of spirit level approach, um, you know, the argument that he's posing is that it's income inequality that determines the level of trust in society, um, the level of solidarity, if you like. But what if, what if the causal mechanism goes the other way? You know, if you look at, at the Nordic countries are often held up as examples, perhaps there's some fundamental level of solidarity that they have that means that they're willing to sign up as a society to higher taxes on the wealthy, higher taxes on the rich. Um, so that brings us back to this sort of chicken and egg question. You know, unless people, uh, unless society as a whole is willing to address inequality, and people feel that they have that level of solidarity. How can we not? How can we bring about uh, reductions in inequality? But crucially, perhaps it's that solidarity that affects that underlying solidarity that affects people's well-being and status anxiety and all these other outcomes. So perhaps it's not income inequality that's driving it. Perhaps these it's these this underlying. Uh, uh, you, 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 united nature of society. It, I think, in truth, these things reinforce each other. So the more unequal society becomes, it probably becomes more fragmented. It means that people are willing, less willing to buy into, um, you know, tax reforms that would reduce in, inequality. Uh, so I think all these things uh, interact, and I'm not sure where one starts and, and, the, and the other ends. Yeah, and you know, to, to add to that, I'd say there there are strong incentives for for separation, and part of this is you know, so uh, like one of the more important um, theories of, of sorting that's been developed uh, is the the home voter thesis in in uh, the U.S., which argues that you know basically as a very strong mechanism for exclusionary policy is is uh, the preservation of property values, um, and and this is a huge source of of uh, wealth um, uh, among American homeowners. Um, so so it is a, a key challenge. 
what I would say is it's not entirely clear how strongly the incentives for exclusion are aligned on every issue. Um, if you think it's, you know, that it's important to solve collective challenges, like if you think clim the climate crisis is going to affect you, then you have to figure out how to set up a spatial system where you're reducing greenhouse gas emissions. You know, so that's like one collective outcome. If you start to notice that, you know, the coronavirus doesn't respect the boundaries that uh, we have used to carve up space, um, then then you might think, okay, maybe maybe we do need to act collectively. Um, to uh, establish some kind of political movement or some kind of political institution that that crosses uh, these local boundaries. Um, you know, so there are a whole host of outcomes. I mean, other outcomes that I've looked at that I didn't talk so much about are the overdose rate, um, the suicide rate. Uh, like these are uh, predicted by the prevalence of boundaries. So, so when we have spatial systems that are defined by separation, um, by exclusion, uh, a whole set of collective outcomes get worse. Um, and so you, you do have some outcomes at a very micro level uh, where like property values, for instance, that could, you could argue, are, are benefit from exclusion and benefit from the formation of spatial barricades. And I think that's why they form. Um, you can also make the case that there are a bunch of collective outcomes uh, that get worse when we have such a divided spatial system. Um, but the, I think the larger point here is is that the the incentives are are really tricky and provide um, lead to uh, pessimism about whether uh, the types of of policy solutions that I might have in mind have any realistic hope of being implemented. And I think that's, you know, that's, at least in the US context, we're, we're dealing with that right now where we have a new president who ha is utilizing a rhetoric of unity uh, and collective action. Um, and, and the assumption seems to be that that rhetoric uh, of unity will be sufficient um, to actually get people to start to come together um, and, and really, um, support uh, large-scale collective investments. Uh, and I, so I think it, it's, it's being tested whether rhetoric alone um, is sufficient. Um, uh, my hunch is that uh, some other approaches might be more effective, such as a social movement that transcends local boundaries, uh, which we started to see this summer in, in the US at least. Um, but anyway, that's an important conversation that I'd love love to get other audience members uh, ideas about that question. Yeah, I mean, I mean, one of the things that just was very briefly that, that, that just came to mind, as you mentioned that, Pat, is that in the UK context, the, the problem of this link between in, spatial inequality and, and, and governance has a certain existential quality for us because Britain is one of the most spatially unequal countries in the world. But it's also one of the most centralized in terms of of, of power, um, and, and that that is not a good combination. So in Britain we have this growing gulf between London and the southeast and, and the rest of the UK, in terms of productivity, in terms of house prices, in terms of quality of life, in terms of life expectancy, etc. And what's happening is, as, as one as one uh, uh, report put it recently, Britain is decoupling. You know, there's this increasing pressure then. Um, on, on, on regions wanting to pull away, whether it's Scotland, whether it's Northern Ireland, whether it's uh, city regions, the current system isn't working. The, the, the gulf is growing and that makes the governance of the whole system fundamentally flawed uh, and, and the potential for this kind of existential crisis for the, for, for the UK. So I think you know, the levelling up agenda has come about because, you know, the Conservative government managed to win seats in some of these northern areas, and that suddenly made it in their interest to address the address those inequalities. Whether they'll actually do that, I think, is is another is another question. It will indeed be in the pudding, I think. Um, okay, <laughs> nice question here, which sort of brings it back to some of those ideas in and around 
the relational aspects of how a person you know, thinks about their own personal circumstances and in inequality and um, thinking about uh, the influences that this might have that have changed over time and um, so it's not just about who you know now but it's also those things in and around social media a, an awareness of global um, through the media and otherwise of what other people might have or how they are you know our, all our horizons have changed in a sense um, yeah. so you know how does that affect people's um, yeah. perspectives of where they are in it or how unequal the world really is um, and I think Kanna G has given a really good example here in terms of she says about uh, does our perception of status matter comparatively to others or is the idea of status much more about than simply income, which I think in effect was what you were saying, uh, Gwilym, to do with ideas about, you know, you don't need a unidimensional, but you need a multidimensional approach. Mm. Um, which gives the great example of a dad who would see himself as working class and disadvantaged even today, even though he might be earning mm. 40 grand a year. But the nature mm. of his work, working as a manual labourer in a, a factory performing routine tasks, reflects his perception of where he is relative to the mm. wider world yeah two great points there uh, i mean the first one about social media from my perspective that reinforces this notion that our subjective um perception of our status is based on this flow of dyadic comparisons because when you're flicking through Facebook, whatever it is, you're comparing yourself to individuals, you know, where they went on holiday or how nice their house is, etc. You haven't got, I would say, an objective distribution in some single dimension such as income. Quite the opposite. You've got this flow of constant comparisons that you're that, that's leaving you with this overall sense of where your position is and that can be radically shifted in a moment you know you might feel very happy having talked to your work colleagues about what they earn and where they live but then you go onto social media and you and you see someone that you went to school with and they've got a bigger house than yours and all of a sudden you feel diminished you feel like you're poor um so i so i i i think social media is, is in some ways exacerbated uh, that or, or made it more complex and maybe heightened it made it a bit more amorphous um, and it is global you're absolutely right i think uh, which 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 even more reinforces the point of uh, or questions this idea of a simple and national income distribution that we all position ourselves on the other question about you know it being in multiple dimensions it, for example being based on our roots our history i think that's a really interesting point um, I'm from, you know, I'm from a working class background and I've, I've stopped calling myself working class because I think it's completely disingenuous. You know, my dad was a miner, but I'm not a miner, um, you know, but I still sometimes think of myself as being, you know, working class. And it's really, that's really quite absurd. So, I, but yeah, that's interesting, you know, how it shapes the lens through which we look um, and and also the, the kind of social group that, that I have and my you know, my contact with my family, all those things shape you know where where I think I am in the world and my sense my sense of 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 of, uh, of status anxiety. So yeah, I, I I fully buy into those two interesting points. There's um, a really useful set of comments here from Katie Higgins. It's more a comment than a question, but just to point everybody in the direction of some publications by. Alicia Croza on seeing inequality, relative affluence and elite perceptions in Mexico. And another um, piece by Rachel Sherman, Uneasy Street, um, that's published about mm. elite perceptions of inequality and relative to wealth and income, mm. which I think is worth tapping into uh, in and around mm. some of these themes, you think. I mean, there's obviously lots of comments here about how great you, both your talks have been. And I think actually work really well together in terms of the balance of them um, and then from Gareth Griffith um, he says I wonder whether both of you have opinions on inequality in engagement inequality and the likelihood that folks on these tales of these distributions will be realistically captured in testable data always a problem um, and uh, wonders about you know what it feels like if that predicts participation at all or whether it will scupper the efforts to quantify these impacts in inequality so 
how well do you think we do capture it with the data and the different aspects of it that you might be looking I'll, I'll add a tiny little one onto that and I'm you know, thinking of, I'm thinking about residential segregation all the time in a lot of the things that you talk about which obviously can work in very different ways in different um, national contexts but you know house prices how much does that reinforce some of these things the barriers and the ability to move between you know socially and understand the world the wider world mm. I, think, I think we'll give that to both of you <laughs> i'll kick off with a quick with, with an initial thought um i mean wh where this framework takes us is to, is to try and work at the individual level and link spatial um, uh, attributes of, of, of neighborhoods at an individual level which would seem completely beyond the the, uh, the the reality of what we could do as researchers a few years ago but increasingly that's that's become that's becoming feasible so to give you an example we now have publicly available house price data for every dwelling in the uk so we could we could we could use we could do Marx's little house on the prairie uh, parable, and we can apply that in reality. And we've started to do uh, that uh, in in a modest way, where, for example, say you've got a survey data like Understanding Society or the the ONS longitudinal study that follows people over time, you could link to that data the local inequality structure that that a person has based on where they live. And that might affect a whole range of things in terms of their well-being, their progress through life, uh, 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 etc. In the States, we come across even better data at individual uh, level. Um, and of course, in Nordic countries, we, we, we have individual lab data for the entire population, um, at a very fine spatial scale. Um, so I think I think the data is joining up in very exciting ways that makes this kind of framework you know much much more feasible um so that that would, you know that would be my initial thought on the sort of data side i don't know if you have any thoughts uh pat from from your perspective yeah well i agree that there's all new forms of data that are that are becoming available uh quality is is yet to be determined in some cases but for instance you know i'm uh analyzing right now um flows of movement uh across areas uh with with nationally uh in the u.s and so that's a data source available from the cell phone companies um uh just recently this this year uh in response to the coronavirus um uh, but it's, you know, it, for people interested in spatial inequality, it's, it's a fascinating resource because it, it provides this other perspective on how communities are separated from each other. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, I think there's lots of new opportunities and then there are, are longstanding problems. Uh, and in, in the U.S., one particular problem is the prevalence of uh, people who are left out of large-scale surveys because they are uh, imprisoned, because they are in the jail or prison system. Uh, this has a huge impact on our national statistics on things like unemployment, for instance. Um, Bruce Western uh, and uh, Becky Pettit have done a lot of work on this issue um, as it relates to uh, economic outcomes um, uh, in, in large-scale U.S. surveys. So it's, it's a huge problem. Um, it does relate tangentially to a question that I wanted to find an excuse to ask uh, Gwilym. Uh, so so I, what, what I love ab about your talk, Gwilym, is um, thinking about these issues as relational. Uh, I, I think that that perspective is not as commonly uh, used when we're talking about neighborhood inequality or, or urban inequality more generally. Um, and so I, I, I think it's a, I think it's right on. I think it's extremely valuable. Now I, I want to ask you about your conceptualization of this at the individual level, uh, as opposed to at the level at a at a more spatial level. So you know when when I'm focusing on on barricades and the way that space is carved up, I'm explicitly trying to push us toward a an understanding of a um, urban area as a spatial system where the outcomes of a group on one side of the barricades are directly related to the outcomes and the actions uh, 
of, of groups mm -hmm. on the on the other. Um, mm -hmm. And so you can think about that as a dyadic relationship, but you can also mm -hmm. think about it as a spatial relationship where, where communities and the resources available, the institutions that serve that community um, mm -hmm. are directly related to the institutions, the resources, um, the advantages, the risks, the opportunities of uh, that are present in that space on the other side. So, you know, if you think about this as, as I, I call this a spatial or relational system, um, yeah. then then you can measure it at the individual level, but you but you can also measure it at the community level or, you know, whatever, whatever the relevant level of analysis is, whether it's towns, cities, schools, so forth. So I'm just yeah. wondering what pushes you to think about that at the individual level or at the dyadic level. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my initial thoughts are, first of all, the framework is potentially very flexible because you can add in additional layers. Um, so, for example, you might have one layer that might have income and people's relative position in income but then you could add on to that these um you could add on to that social networks whether people know each other um and who their close friends are if you have uh, information on that and then you could add on networks that reflect um uh, power relations uh, between groups and then what you can you can specify, you can bring space in in multiple ways. You can do it through saying, you know, you can define an egocentric network of inequality relations based on the 20 nearest neighbors or within a radius of 100 meters or either side of a barricade or whatever it might be. Um, crucially, what you're doing is effectively you're building up a much richer per, per, uh, set of information on that individual. You're saying this is their position in multiple dimensions. And then you can feed that into some outcome measure that you're interested in. It might be their life expectancy, it might be their progress in education, et cetera. So I think what it offers is a richer way potentially of bringing in these multiple layers of information at different spatial scales. Some of them might be non-spatial, some of them might be entirely spatial or aggregated at, spa at, at neighborhood level. Um, it also allows you to define neighborhoods in much more nuanced ways because if you've got if all you're looking at is nodes you can say well a neighborhood isn't just where the census border is you can say a neighborhood is you know in terms of well it could be an egocentric neighborhood or it could be a neighborhood made up of a density you know a, de a given density or threshold density of connections in in in, 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 in in multiple dimensions so i think potentially what it offers is a framework that then could lead to the testing of lots of different Hypothesis, uh, hypotheses if you you know, real if you build up data sets that that, that fit within this framework did, did that answer your question <laughs> yeah it does it does we should talk more but that's great thanks yeah we do well, very good i i very unhelpfully dropped out for a while so <laughs> <laughs> but, I'll <laughs> <laughs> sure. but i'll be able to look at that answer to that one back later um we, we're getting towards the end of, well i think we're officially at the end of time i'm, I'm happily to uh, carry on asking questions if you want to carry on answering them or we can wrap it up there i'll i'll, I'll leave that up to you to decide i'm happy to take one more question if that if that okay. I think, I think there's probably it's probably one that I always like ending up with, which I think is echoed by two questions, which can be wrapped into one from AP, but also David Manley about the policy implications of what you're talking talking about. You you know, it's always good to end up when we think about these things about what's the the real world policy implications of some of these things. So David Manley said, you know, researchers and policymakers have often recommended creating mixed tenure or mixed income neighborhoods as a policy solution to inequalities. Perhaps, but perhaps this is not the best response if it is likely to cause individual stress through relational inequality. So what do the two of you think on that one? My, my response would be that the problem is partly an oversimplification in, in, in historical studies of what we mean by mixed communities because it's just simply based on for example the percentage of people in a neighborhood with this property and the percentage of people in a neighborhood with that property rather than saying well what are the actual structures the relational structures and how they bear out in space 
how do those then how do particular combinations lead to success or failure um, in, in, in various outcomes, whether it's you know connections between communities, uh, rivalry or conflict between communities, um, social mobility within communities. So I, I'm saying actually there's a great big black hole where we don't know the answer to those things. And if we had to if we to really understand what are the combinations of of inequality relations um, in these various dimensions of whether it's housing, whether it's um, income, and how that overlays onto issues of, of ethnic mix, etc. I, I, I think we don't really have the information that we need to answer that yet. And, but hopefully, you know, there's something useful in what we're proposing that, that might enrich that. What do you think, Pat? Um, well, I think we have enough evidence that uh, at least young people in um, communities that are more heterogeneous do better uh, across a range of outcomes. You know, so that's a first order. Now, it, it one you know could test whether there are impacts on on stress or other dimensions um, of uh, mental well-being um, that may not you know, um, go in the same direction. So I think that would be interesting to look at. I, I guess the other piece that I would say, though, is in, in and this, this, you know, you can tell me whether this ap applies in the same way um, in the UK context. Um, but here, one of the central reasons for arguing for a policy agenda designed to reduce concentrated poverty or increase uh, the income mix um, within within communities is that communities of concentrated poverty have uh, been the objects of disinvestment. Uh, they have been places where political power uh, um, is lost, where institutions are not supported, uh, where a punitive policy is is implemented. And so that's that's like a big part of why this matters, uh, at least in the US, is because of our, our policy agenda uh, and the way that investments are made and then extracted in different communities in the, in the US, the way that power is distributed across communities. So it's not just that, you know, kids do better if they're not going to school only with other low-income kids. You know, I, th I think that's true to an extent, but that's not sufficient. It's, it's really that, the way that we invest in communities depends on the mix uh, of, of and, and that's a reality of, of US social policy. So if, if investments were distributed across communities uh, in an equitable way, then I would be much less concerned about concentrated poverty. Um, it, it's really a process of our, of our uh, political approach to urban inequality. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, a, a great way to end it. <laughs> well, that, Absolutely. That, that's my job for me. So um, thanks all for taking part and for hanging on for the extra five minutes. And thanks, Gwilym and Pat, for two really interesting um, presentations, but also for a really good debate afterwards of some of the ideas and how they relate to each other. So I'm sure there will be more seminars in this series, Gwilym, which I'm sure people can find about on your website. Um, and so I look forward to popping into some more of them at another time. Okay, everyone, thanks for coming, and we'll see you again. Thank you. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye. 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 <laughs>